All right, hi, this is Harry Campbell. I'm calling uh, Dr. Marilee Esty uh, to do a conversation about her book um, that is called Conquering Concussion. This is the, uh, the book here. And it's uh, healing TBI symptoms with neurofeedback and without drugs. So um, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Well, thank um, you, Harry. I think we're going to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Is it okay if we laugh a little bit? It, it is. It's always okay to laugh, I think. <laughs> um, I, I like that. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing, it, and also uh, uh, Dr. Esty is, is doing the interview today. The, her uh, co-author is, is uh, Carol Shiflett, which uh, I'll, let, I'll let you talk a little bit about, uh, about Carol and, and how you work together on, on the book. But uh, first, just tell me a, a little bit more about yourself um, and, and your background. Oh, my goodness. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Just so people know who you are uh, that don't it, that don't already know you. Let's make it short. Uh, I started doing biofeedback and neurofeedback back in '88 after the first training at the Medinger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, where they had a superb psychophysiological lab. Nobody ever really looked at the body in the way they did. Just doing reporting and finding by accident, for example, that sometimes a biofeedback really helped with migraines. They were just uh, suggesting that one of the receptionists might just see if she could raise the temperature in her hand, peripheral skin temperature, which means vasodilation throughout the body. <laughs> and when she was, they were through, she said, oh, my migraine went away. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, so it's the accidental discoveries, I think, that, well, as we know, they often make huge change. And so I started doing biofeedback, and then eventually they would have training in a form of neurofeedback that was used for cancer patients. And then they found out that, my goodness, that worked really well for post-traumatic stress. And an incredible researcher named Eugene Penniston then applied that to Vietnam veterans who had been hospitalized many, many times for addiction. He didn't talk about post-traumatic stress, although he was measuring for those changes, blood changes, etc. They had a control group, and that set the stage for modern applications with, of course, more accurate equipment, mm -hmm. uh, PCs and uh, laptops, etc. And so, of course, now the technology for recording tiny, tiny changes in all sorts of body function have just produced a revolution. Mm -hmm. Many so, people don't know, for example, that just using um, some of the simple uh, heart rate variability or autonomic nervous system biofeedback has even it's been used at Cleveland Clinic, and they've taken people off of the heart transplant list. Wow. And they're doing more with that now. That, that's so the amazing. Bodies, the bodies are our best, best friend. The, you know, we've got to keep them. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> of course, the brain is constantly, constantly trying to fix itself when there's been any kind of problem. And so neurofeedback is just, in a sense, holding hands with our bodies and our brains. Mm -hmm. And then amazing change is available. So I got into neurofeedback kind of by chance. And that was 22 years ago. And now I'm doing nothing but one particular kind of neurofeedback with a lot of published research for veterans, for people with fibromyalgia, etc. And I think all the field is getting better at this all the time. So no matter, how, Go ahead. I was just going to say, so how, how did you um, get interested in working with concussion? Uh, let's say the clients found me. Uh -huh. And then we found that they'd been diagnosed with oh, all kinds of things, including psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, but the common element, the common element was in the histories of some kind of head injury. Mm -hmm. Some of them really serious. And I didn't pay a lot of attention, but after a while you have to. <laughs> you know. I was fine. I didn't have, uh, I didn't hear voices until I got whacked by that jaguar in 
Hmm. Like literally, you don't have it. Um, so by paying attention and letting them teach me, that made the connection. And then I, that was, uh, oh my goodness, 1994, 95. Uh, someone I knew who was helping set up what is now the Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine had a different name back then. Uh, the doctor I knew, and they sent somebody out to see what I was doing, and then within the year I was asked to accept a grant to treat mild and moderate brain injury. And that changed everything. So I've done nothing but that since. Wow. And unfortunately, the line <laughs> is still forming for all neurofeedback providers. And the book started out because Carol Shifflett, who is um, an incredible researcher, but observer, I think is maybe the most exalted title, to observe human behavior mm. and see and, and just read. She's an omnivorous reader, and she never forgets anything she's read, which I am very jealous of. <coughs> so she came to visit, bringing the manuscript of her book called Migraine, Brains, and Bodies, which is the best book on migraines out there. Mm. Really, everybody should read it. And in the process, that's when I asked her if she might do a little brochure on concussion, TBI, for my clients. And now we have a 307 page <laughs> brochure. So, so this, this was a brochure. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah, started out as a brochure. And wow. I rip it. It doesn't. <laughs> it was, you know, its birth was an accident, but a very good uh -huh. uh, We've gotten very good reviews. But the purpose of it was not to sell neurofeedback, uh -huh. but to educate people about concussion. I have a real simple question. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is a concussion? We, I mean, we hear the word all the time, and a lot of times there's words out there that people assume they understand, and maybe maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, yeah, well, you've, you've kind of poked a hole in the whole medical profession, because there is no clear definition. We struggled with that writing. Um, in the book, we've got tables of the symptoms that can follow simple, quote, simple concussion, mm -hmm. or what, what gets called mild traumatic brain injury by mm -hmm. the physician. But there is no one definition. The very words traumatic brain injury are pretty frightening. Right. I've, I've had a lot of clients say, well, you know, I would say, have you had a brain injury? Oh, no, I never had that. You never have a concussion? Oh, yeah, I've had concussions. But, you know, there's this huge um, string, you know, a continuum from the ding that leaves you a little bit wobbly for a few uh -huh. minutes, and then you're okay. So, of course, the coach sends you back in to really being completely disabled for a variety of reasons. So that's a challenge that faces the field. I was just at a very interesting meeting called Pink Concussion at Georgetown Medical School. The focus being on women's concussion in women, not just athletes, but women in general. Because it is different from men, the concussion that men get. And we've got a great picture in the book, an illustration, Carol's a great illustrator, <coughs> that shows to a, a male driver next to, you know, in the background, a female driver. Women's necks never, ever, ever, ever get as strong as men's. So we are more likely to suffer whiplash, and of course the focus end is on the neck and the headache, but not on the trigger point patterns that result from that that make you much more liable to have a headache. So we've got this picture here in the book on page 81, if you want to find it in yours. Can you see that? Well, you, if you just uh, bring it a little bit higher and a little bit further back to you, we'll see it better. Yeah, there. That's okay. good. I will try to hold still. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> so the image on the far, let's see, on your side, that would be the far left, I think, Uh huh. is a normal neck curvature. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. 
in the middle, you can see, I think very clearly, that the neck is very straight. Mm -hmm. That's called a military neck, usually. Uh -huh. also say straight neck, I think. That will more than likely cause head pain. But it may not be there all the time. It may come and go. Because just a ton of nerves run through those um, vertebrae uh -huh. in the spine. And then the one on the edge to the far edge of the page, it may be difficult to see there, but the atlas vertebrae, vertebra, the one right under the skull, is shoved forward ahead of the others. Those people have constant pain. Uh huh. And we often have people who've been in a whiplash and have the symptoms and, and headache and maybe other things um, get a scan from the side because usually they, you know, scans are done from the front and the back to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But you get one from the side, and it's it's that curve is called the lobotic curve or cervical curve, and they need a special treatment. Um, the best treatment that's non-invasive for that is done by a craniosacral specialist. Usually a, an osteopath is trained uh -huh. in dealing with that. Because until that curve, assuming no other you know, huge damage like crush or something or something really terrible, mm -hmm. uh, that can usually be reversed. In fact, I've had two clients who were scheduled for neck surgery when we realized that they had this condition. The surgeries were canceled in just two or three treatments. Wow. Treatments. They no longer had pain. Wow. One was a professor here at one of the universities. She'd been suffering for eight years. And I called her and I said, look, I think this is what's going on. Sure enough. And she, she said, well, I scheduled for neck surgery in two weeks. <laughs> and she didn't have it. And she was off on the mm, Amazing. You need to know about the body. Now, a large part of the book is about the bones in the brain. You know, it's not a solid bowling ball. There's just, I forget how many. It's, it's shocking. Uh -huh. And they move. And if they don't kind of stay in their territory, <laughs> we get problems. Now, you, you mentioned the the um, the headaches. Right. Now, there, well, part, I guess there, I have so many questions. <laughs> but okay. the, uh, so we talked about what is a concussion and we, and there's also the term traumatic brain injury. And are they one and the same or uh, you know that was a, a question and then also besides the headaches what what are the other symptoms or some of the other symptoms that uh, oh that's a long list um it can be loss of appetite the body temperature changes the veterans i'm working with who come back from iraq and afghanistan often feel colder mm. than other people and when i Ask, I mean, we have a question about that. Do you tend to feel colder or warmer than other people in the same temperature? And they say, well, it was so hot over there, of course I feel colder. <laughs> it's not what it is. The brain's floating in fluid. It, it moves around when there's you know, acceleration, deceleration. And the blast injuries cause their own kind of thing. But sports injuries, you know, very common. And, of course, motor vehicle accidents, falls, et cetera. What happens is... And that question is a key to whether there's pituitary thyroid damage. Because the pituitary is housed in a little tiny, really cute little condo in the base of the skull, but then it can't move. So its fibers go up into the hypothalamus, which, among other things, controls appetite, thirst, and body temperature. So when any of those things appear as symptoms, things that people are dealing with every day, you can assume that, you know, they really need a good thyroid workup. And it's difficult to find an endocrinologist who will take post-concussion symptoms seriously because everything else seems, you know, you look okay. All right. And it's probably a passing phase. Well, there was an international meeting not two, I mean, two or three years ago to try to establish standard of care for endocrinologists after TBI to s know when to start because what will happen is weight gain. Uh, of, of course, the body temperature being kind of messed up. Um, sex drive is just gone frequently. That's important. Right. Sure. Appetite and thirst 
are all clean. And if it doesn't get treated pretty soon, you know, these are going to be big problems. Right, you're, you're dealing with a lot of, you, you mentioned um, the uh, soldiers, and you, you also um, mentioned athletes, and so a lot of these obviously are going to be younger people. Yes. And and so that's a lifelong sentence. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. So that that's uh, and then also you, you it sounds like some of the symptoms that you're talking about. It goes back to one of my earlier questions: is how, how you got into working with con concussions. But it sounds like people are coming to or were were or and are coming to you for things other than the head injury they, they're coming oh, right. to you for the symptoms oh, yeah. and you're tying it into that you know after investigating that there was a head injury and it could be associated with that yeah so we're kind of working backwards uh -huh. the symptoms. in fact there's more and more research out there now that are is documenting that early childhood concussion is probably the cause of ADD, ADHD. Mm. And actually it was John Freeman, who at the time we were on a brain injury program together, uh, said that when a child brought to us with the question being, he was pediatric neurology at Hopkins, uh, why the learning problem? Why the behavior, et cetera? He said, we know now that we have to ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. about early falls mm -hmm. in childhood because Johnny will and Susie will be diagnosed with ADD or ADHD later on. Mm -hmm. So if you look in the now old DSM-4, <laughs> you'll see that if you look under post-concussion and attention deficit, the criteria for reaching those diagnostic conclusions are virtually the same. Mm -hmm. and it makes, I just have so many kids who are brought in here like that. And, there was an interesting one recently where this boy <coughs> had been diagnosed with ADHD. He was a young teenager. And I met with his mother to get the history, and no, no, he never had anything happen. No, he never fell. He never, you know, he defied gravity all of his life. Right. <laughs> uh, so he came in, and I asked him, and he started to say it. His mother said, what are you talking about? He said, Mom, what about this scar? What about <laughs> this scar? I mean, they were... She didn't see them anymore, and then she remembered. It happened wow. All the time. Huh. And, it, it, it's, it's and, and that's a case when there were actually yeah. scars, but sometimes yeah. they're not scars. <laughs> you know, the invisible scars do not show. And that's why it is so difficult for people who have been rear-ended, whiplashed. They're accused of malingering. I'm in depositions frequently, and it's, it's just nobody... Most people don't understand. And if you look okay, be prepared. Yeah, yeah. Say, you're fine. Or the car wasn't demolished, so how could you be hurt? Right. And Carol's got a really good section in the book about um, uh, low-impact rear endings. Mm -hmm. The car, you know, there are probably some bumps and bruises and dents or paint or something. But the physics are that the body, that the car has not um, received or absorbed all of that impact. It goes into the occupant. Right. If you're rear-ended at a high speed, the car's going to absorb most of that impact. <laughs> now, obviously, there, there are gradations there. But it's really tough on people who have some pretty bad damage inside, especially a contra coup, um, you know, with the brain being flipped back and forth, and it happens so fast. Yeah, a lot happens in that short amount of time. So it has always been my wish that we would change color that would reflect how much damage we had inside. Uh huh. Because we've had neurologists tell people, well, why don't you just get a hobby and then you won't think about it so much? Or get a job. And wow. you can't. Wow. <laughs> now, one thing that may change all of that, I'm very hopeful, in the September 
2015 Discovery Magazine. There's a wonderful article called Broken Cables. And they have, some guys there, have created a new kind of imaging that for the first time actually shows broken neurons. Mm -hmm. You couldn't argue with that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you had that on your side. Just try to get disability if you look okay. Right. Even if you can't stand bright light, you can't tolerate noise, you become pretty much a hermit. Mm -hmm. like some of the veterans and actually retired NFL players never leave their rooms mm -hmm. because it's too overwhelming. The whole world is too much. And nobody gets it. They don't get it. Yeah. And, you know, um, people don't, they get accused of just wanting to live on disability. Right. You don't leave a full, rich life. Right. In order to be on disability. And right. You've had a great job, you loved it, you know, your family, you like playing mm -hmm. with your kids. You can't do that anymore. Right. That's wrong. Yeah. But it's ingress. Mm hmm In some cases, it's, you know, legal parties battling each other. Right. You, you had mentioned um, the the spine and the neck and so on. Uh, what what about the the, the brain? Um, how how is it actually uh, injured in in some cases? Yeah, good question. Our brains float in fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, and you know are anchored to the spine through the the old brain. And we can take a certain amount of movement. Obviously, we couldn't play games and stuff. And actually, just move through space if it didn't work. So you've got a gyroscope in there that tells you which way is up. But when we're moving through space and we hit something solid, the skull stops, but the brain keeps going forward and then it bounces back. And if it's a lot of acceleration, deceleration, it may happen several times. If we get spun, and certainly there are a lot of car wrecks that, where there are rollovers, or the end of the front of the car gets clipped and you spin around this way. And you may also roll over. The brain is, is just being torn all over the place. Mm -hmm. It would be a great design if the inside of the skull were smooth. Mm -hmm. But the temporal bones are like rasps. They've got all kinds of rough bones sticking out. So if the brain goes back and forth, the temporal lobes and the whole area are being cut, torn, mm. and depending on the amount of force. Mm -hmm. uh, the frontal lobes sit in kind of their own little hollowed out places in the skull, but they've got sharp ridge that divides them, sets them off from the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. So there's all this roughness. Right. It can cause bleeding, certainly contusions, bruising, if you will. And every time there's some impact like that. There's a neurochemical cascade that's thought to be protective. So it comes in, in the way a neurosurgeon described it to me, it comes in and it blankets that area with inhibitory transmitters. So that part can't talk, can't send signals to or receive signals from other parts of the brain. So, and that can be anywhere in the brain. It doesn't matter. It can be anywhere at all. Uh, <clears throat> but everything, every process that our brains can handle, except one, sense of smell, the only one that does not require communication among different parts. And obviously that can vary depending on what part has been or parts have been protected. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to ask about sense of smell because there's a tiny, tiny bone, a uh, very, very thin bone right behind the nose called the ethmoid. Lots of little holes in it. Um, look it up. It's really cute. <laughs> it, but it's very fragile. So if the brain bounces back and forth a lot, it breaks. Mm -hmm. It can be broken. Then 
people will find that they can't taste things like they used to. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can only smell or taste a few things. I've had people who can't smell or taste anything. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of sad. Yeah, that's no fun. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Even if you live with a good cook, <laughs> you know, you, you're being deprived. I, I am still treating, in one of the studies we're doing for veterans, um, a fellow who said, yeah, you know, he could smell some things, but he, his favorite thing was to just order anything and dump the hottest sauce over it. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, what's wrong with you? And he said, because I can taste that. It's really, really good. That's good food. Well, now <laughs> he's had a few treatments. And we came, because we keep track at every session of, of the most bothersome symptoms. Uh -huh. And he says, oh, yeah, he says, we were eating, and I did that, and I couldn't eat it. It was so strong. Wow. <laughs> so now he tastes and smells normally, and that's great. Yeah. That's a, a good sign that, you know, at least that part of the brain is changing, but, of course, others change. Right. So we track symptoms, the ones that are the most troublesome to anyone. In every session we ask if there's been any change, because we want to know. Right. If if we're doing anything to help, and those sensory things are, are very important. So you know, feeling hot and cold and pain. So so how does um how does neurofeedback um work to help heal the the brain? Well, I can throw the most common explanations. <laughs> you might as well ask how does repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation work. Most people don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all make guesses. As uh, Dr. Ayuba Maya, who was a major, major brain injury uh, surgeon around here at NIH, mm -hmm. said that you know all we can do is make up stories <laughs> of what we see happen, uh -huh. how the changes happen, in people, and what changes happen. And he he said that was the only way he could explain the quick changes in his brain injury clients his patients, my clients, mm -hmm. that change very quickly. Um, he thinks that most of those symptoms and changes are a result of those kind of neurotransmitter blankets mm -hmm. that isolate parts of the brain from the game. In fact, I, I tell kids that after you get concussed, it's probably very much like a hockey game or a soccer game where you've got people on the sidelines. They're not allowed to play now. Mm -hmm. But it's still called a game. Right. It's really hard on the ones left on the field. Mm -hmm. Because the brain is always trying to fix itself. Mm. Always trying to fix itself, which is why nutrition is important. We'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> so when those he, Dr. Amaya thought that this tiny signal that, that comes in that's being controlled in its speed by the brain, its, by the brain itself does, does something to sort of tickle those uh, neurotransmitters that are inhibitory that you can go home now. There's no more danger. It's just that there's no reset button. Mm -hmm. you know, the, brain, the brain's first job is to keep us alive. Right. And when there's pain... You know, some of the executive um, functions get diverted from the job of paying attention to the world around you to get rid of the pain because the brain interprets that as the tremendous danger. In that realm, in that job, there's no um, there's no gray. You're either in danger or you're not. Right. Which is good. I mean, you kind of need to be alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is where nutrition comes in. Uh, most people, and I, I really stress this, don't eat enough protein during that phase of recovery. Mm -hmm. And the brain needs really, really good building blocks to repair itself. Because it will grow back neurons. It will grow back connections. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you know, you can't repair your house unless you've got materials. Mm -hmm. And everybody who has been willing to do this says, oh, I have so much more energy. Mm -hmm. kids at school, oh, I'm not falling asleep in class. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot we can do ourselves. That and do everything we can to get good sleep. Right. Because sleep is, you know, insomnia is a common aftermath of concussion. Mm -hmm. 
several of our veterans, and we've got um, some videos on our website of veterans saying that after a first treatment, some of them have slept eight and nine hours. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's common whether you're a veteran or not. Mm -hmm. Because that's the repair stage. So uh, there's just so much that goes on. Mm -hmm. But if we don't take care of ourselves, and if possible, stop risky behavior. Now, there's a wonderful book. Um, it's called Sports Concussion in Young Adults athletes or something. It's out by the Institute of Medicine uh -huh. uh, of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Okay. It is a great book. It covers so much. Mm -hmm. But in there's this whole section on um, uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. And they look at all of the commonly used tests, maybe some of them not even commonly used. And they concluded, and this is a committee of scientists, that the best evaluation was quantitative EEG. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, you know, there's a lot of discussion and there's guidelines in the various teams, or, you know, team, you know, like NCAA. How do you decide when to return a player to the field? And even with the tests that are used, what they found, the QEEG was the only one that actually picked up that there were still problems, still um, underlying EEG, brain, and function that we cannot be aware of and that don't show up on the other test. Mm. So return to play is very important because if you're not really back, you shouldn't be out there. Now, now do you feel like, and this is something that I kind of wondered about, um, do, do you feel like there would be resistance from the teams to... You know how sometimes people don't want to know something <laughs> because oh, you, it, you're, it, you're, you're poking your fingers in <laughs> <laughs> dangerous places. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> we, we don't have to say too much about it, but I, I always wonder about that. Is that you know they, there's the concussion protocols and all that stuff, and. I'm, I, I don't know how much goes into all of that, but I, I always wonder, gee, you know, QEG uh, would uh, probably tell so much, but yeah. do we really, well, I guess you have to say who we are, but uh, some of us may not really want to have that all of that data. I don't know. Right. Well, I can give an example that um, Carol found out when she talked to people that who create the King Devic, D E V I C K test, King Devic test that was normed on boxers. Uh huh. Oh wow. Got hard data, really really good hard data. Uh huh. And because I got a hockey player back on the ice, there was a large team here, um, you know, well, little tiny kids up to high school, um, <clears throat> who started using that. And it's an eye test. It's an eye speed eye recognition test. Mm -hmm. It only takes just a very few minutes to do it a couple of times. So this hockey team's got about 800 kids in it. Wow. Uh, a, uh, a, parent, a parent of the kid I helped got a committee established with the coaches, the parent. They all agreed that at the beginning of the season, every kid would do this, establish their baseline. Mm -hmm. The time is how fast. The eyes are a key to the brain, mm -hmm. to brain function. So how fast could they do this correctly? Right. So the agreement was, if there's an incident on the ice, the kid would do be pulled off to do that test again. If they didn't meet their baseline, they couldn't go back. Mm -hmm. When the NFL was presented with this, they said, oh, it's too expensive. I think it was a dollar seventeen per player. Uh, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh huh. <laughs> they so, probably spend more on shoelaces than they. Yeah, spend yeah. Money. You know, every every time there's something, uh, you know, some special event, they have special colored cleats and this and that and yeah. the other. So, I, I, yeah, okay. Well, I think maybe blood red. <laughs> and well, I, I don't I don't want to stay on it too much because. I, <laughs> Care for your we'll, life. We'll, 
we just want to uh, I just wanted to bring it up but I, I think that's enough said about that well, you know I, I think everybody should have it yeah yeah I mean we live in gravity it's I suppose it keeps us on the planet but it's it's dangerous yeah yeah definitely Carol has a wonderful list of um, data about concussions from the UK and it's, it's quite amusing the things that are listed as the cause. I believe these were from hospital ERs. One was tea cozies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the little blanket they put over the teapot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, there were all kinds of interesting things. Uh -huh. We can fall anywhere, anytime. We can be here. Yeah. Out of the it's uh, the older I get, and I'm getting pretty old. Uh, I, I never take a first step down a staircase without holding on. Yeah, yeah. Because split second, your life has changed. Right. Totally changed. Right. So for parents, um, it's important to make informed decisions about what your kids do. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if your 12-year-old says, I want to play football, and you're concerned about it. You're the parent, for heaven's sakes. There are a lot of sports we can play. Right. And actually, the um, CDC has a listing of the probability, the risk probability for different sports. Wow. And it's it's kind of, uh, well, it's interesting. Uh-huh. But a lot of people are surprised that, you know, you start with boys football, boys ice hockey, girls concussion, g girls uh, soccer. Uh-huh or the risk of concussion. Uh -huh. And it really goes back to the strength of the neck or the lack of it in women. So now there's more of um, a um, requirement or training to strengthen the neck mm. for girls. Interesting. Because a lot comes from just falling and hitting the ground, running into other players. Right. Heading, heading may not be all that bad if you do it right and don't do too much. I just took in a young soccer player, you know, this week, who became very symptomatic after her coach decided they had to do a huge heady practice. Uh -huh. For 30 minutes, they did nothing but head the ball. Wow. Shouldn't do that. Yeah. She hasn't been able to play since. Wow. Now, of course, we all have our own histories of head injury from childhood on, mm -hmm. but still, if you're doing okay, don't mess with it. Right, right. <laughs> That, you had uh, mentioned uh, the cranial sacral uh, therapy. Um, you also, of course, we talked about neurofeedback and, and nutrition. Are there other um, interventions, non-drug interventions that um, you, you you use or recommend? Um, well, I should stop and think here. Um, the cranial sacral is very important. Um, we couldn't talk about them all in the book. We had to cut out big sections because there are too many. Uh, <clears throat> a good, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the HRV, heart rate variability biofeedback, uh -huh. comprehensive autonomic nervous system feedback, is not only fun, it teaches you skills mm -hmm. that you'll use your entire life right. to deal with anxiety. And post-traumatic stress is virtually always followed head injury. Right. Uh, we, and of course, there are varying degrees of that too. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting what can cause a flashback, like just being in some place that smells like the place you got hurt. Mm -hmm. Smell is a very strong component mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, memory in the body and brain. Uh huh. Um, so the nutrition that uh, neurofeedback and there there are several kinds of neurofeedback and I, I, they're all good so you want to go to the big organization isnr.org look for people who have a lot of experience bica an international organization which means people have been through you know quite a bit of experience had to pass exams and stuff so bcia.org and that's true for um, not just the U.S. Right. The world. Because my feeling is that the better part of prevention is once people understand something about concussion, if there have been 
you know, kids often <laughs> become very athletic, can dive out of the crib before their parents knew they can. Yeah. So you get early, um, uh, early injuries. And in my view, if neurofeedback should be in every school, a kid starts showing behavior problems. The girls usually don't. They're usually the inattentive ADD. Mm -hmm. But they've got some of those learning problems. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, there's been the famous, um, what's it called, Yonkers School um, research project yeah. with uh, traditional neurofeedback. Yeah. Just showing enormous improvement. So it's prevention. Right. Prevention starts with doing the best you can to protect the kid. It's really hard. I mean, I've been standing beside uh, one of my grandkids in particular, and he fell back. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, you know, it's a split second. Right. But as Dr. Freeman put it, uh, you know, they cry, they get up, they seem okay, they run around. Right. But they don't have to go to the office the next day. They don't have to read stuff, write reports, right. take part meetings, right. be able to quickly change in information. And nobody thought about that injury back then. Didn't even think it was an injury. Right. But the reason it's an injury is that our the uh, neurons in the brain uh, eventually the maturity are insulated with something called myelin and it makes them stronger. Mm -hmm. Now that's still going on in, in the early 20s. Mostly done by then. Mm -hmm. But when a kid is little, that's like uh, leaves growing, you know, blowing in the wind. Right. There's no support around it, so it causes more damage than we could possibly know about. Is there a so best... part of prevention is really knowing what the symptoms are. Right. Because so many people say, well, yeah, but his grandfather was like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, how, how often did Grandpa die? Or not die? Right. <laughs> is there a yeah, best yeah. time uh, after the injury to, to use neurofeedback to help someone? Best, I don't know. I I won't treat anyone unless they are medically stable. Now, for most young people, most people who've been concussed, there's usually not much of a problem afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, visible. It certainly can't be any bleeding. Right. But even things like uh, uncontrolled uh, diabetes, mm -hmm. uncontrolled asthma, uncontrolled seizures. You know, that's that's got to be. That's a sign that something more serious is happening. Right. But that can be at any age. Mm -hmm. The youngest I have treated is four years old, and the oldest is ninety-four. And there was improvement, <laughs> <laughs> even in the 94 year old. See, there's hope for us all. Right, there you go. Um, so we talked a little bit about the NFL. Um, I I wasn't uh, – I'm not going to go back into the other part that we talked about. But um, in terms – I've heard, for instance, with uh, – it, there was at least one case of, of, a, of a famous NFL player that had committed suicide. Uh, I think it was Junior Seau, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then in the military, um, it, it, with veterans, I, I've, I've heard that there has been a, a high incidence of, of, of suicide. And in both of those areas, there could be, you know, a, a high degree of concussion. So it, it, do you see a connection between those? Oh, sure. I, and, you know, anybody. In fact, there was a study recently... I think I have it right here. It took place in Canada. Um, they did 20 years of data for civilians, looking especially at what on what day of the week did these concussions occur. And I think they were <laughs> had a lot of weekend warriors. Huh. Uh, what they found is that most of them, a huge number of them, were on weekends. Mm. So I imagine it's, you know, desk jockeys, maybe they're not in the best shape, they get out. But they all had concussions. Huh. So it was about, what was a huge number of people they looked at. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and what they found is that with those sports, usually sports, but it could be anything, but mm. most of them were sports concussions, 
the risk of suicide went up three times. Wow. Now what happens, I certainly hear it from my clients who've been suffering for years because they were misdiagnosed as being, in some cases, psychotic, but always depressed. Um, you know, they never even ask questions about past injuries. Mm -hmm. Many of them are really suffering grief because they're no longer who they were. Mm -hmm. And many have given up hope that they would ever be able to do the work they did before. Right. They would ever be able to be a real father, a real mother, and do things with the kids because they couldn't get over the symptoms. Mm. And some of them give up. Yeah. Uh, and the veterans I've been treating, and there were several who had already attempted suicide, and several more than once, mm. you know, their aim wasn't so good. Um, <clears throat> and they laugh about that. Mm. But with neurofeedback, that's all gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got one who's getting a PhD. Wow. I live in with another one who's getting a PhD. They're very close. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of them had never been to college before. Mm -hmm. But when you uncover the potential, you recover it. Then your whole outlook on life changes. Right. One of the, the first people, in fact, uh, well, in the NIH study that was published in 01, 2001, uh, came in one day and she was so oh, depressed. Mm. And it was a grief reaction. It had been 21 years since her horrible PDI. She had had many surgeries to put her face back together. Wow. And she said, Suddenly, she was able to use her computer and store files and read and be awake more than six hours a day in two-hour intervals. Mm. She said, I didn't know what I'd lost. <laughs> but now I know. Now, that kind of grief reaction doesn't last very long. And I think if people don't have a lot of social support, right. especially family, you know, the future looks very, very bleak. Yeah. I, a um, U.S. representative from Kentucky, not Kentucky, uh, Connecticut, told me that her staff was in touch, and she'd been in touch with the family of a vet who had not left the basement in two years. Wow. And another NFLer was telling me about that, and I coined the term conscious coma. Mm. You're technically alive. Right. Not really alive. Right. The only difference between that kind of awful social is isolation and coma is that you're awake, but you're not really alive. Mm -hmm. And what keeps me going is knowing, just seeing repeatedly that we can really make people's lives richer. Right, and it, it's if you feel like you, you can't escape the condition, and it's like tomorrow it's again, and next day and the yeah. next day and the next day so yeah, it's, it's yeah. on into the future yeah. uh, one of the vets in the pilot study that was published in the journal of neuropsychiatry um, came in one day he was very very quiet and told me then that he'd been at formation at Walter Reed in the morning he says another one of my group uh, shot himself last night he said he's the third one and he waited a while and then he said I didn't tell you when I came in that I was going to kill myself because my family hated me. Mm. I really didn't like being with them. I just didn't see any future. Right. And he said, now I'm a dad. Mm. I love my wife. She says she loves me having a good time with my kids. Mm. You know, people don't talk about that. Right. They just don't. It's sort of not social. But you, you don't want to upset other people. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a big deal, and it's it's great uh, work, you know, as far as helping all these people that are in the situation to, to to have some hope. And I think that's what keeps all neurotherapists going. Yeah. Because how can you stop? I mean, right, right. I, I I jokingly say I could sit on the beach and eat bonbons, but <laughs> I think I get bored pretty quickly. So, so yeah, that's right. So uh, especially when you know that you know the, the stuff that you're you're doing is helping so many people to to stop, you kind of feel guilty, I guess. <laughs> you know. I, I have to tell you this story. I a few years ago, a large high school near here in Bethesda, 
<clears throat> did a whole psychology day. Mm -hmm. So they had several speakers in. I was one of them. And then they wanted, if you could, to go visit a classroom, uh -huh. a psychology class. So I said I would do that. So I made the you know, speech to a whole bunch of people. And I had some PowerPoints also for the class. So I thought, well, you know, they're all interested in learning. So I picked uh, a couple of maps, pre- and post-treatment. Uh -huh. A kid who was in elementary school, very ADHD, sweet kid, but oh, he struggled so. So I talked a little bit. I put those slides up, and this kid said, "Dr. Esty, those are my brain maps." <laughs> <laughs> and they were. I should have recognized him. He was a little kid. That's and funny. He's doing great. That's you funny. Know, it just makes you feel so. Yeah, good. that's great. So, so um. You know, you told me that the the, the book started out as as a, as a brochure. Um, so now I, I one of my questions was why did you write the book? But now I know that. But um, what what would you like to see happen, or what would you like to see different about how concussions are dealt with? Now wait a minute. We've got one hour here. You want me to talk? About that? <laughs> <laughs> well, what we would like to see. Carol's as strong about this, feels as strongly as I do, uh, is for people to understand, not blame the kid and be saying, if you would only apply yourself, <laughs> you know, we're able to do what our brains will let us do. <laughs> but think about what might be the problem. Get help. Don't just yell at them, make them sit there at night struggling for two or three hours after being in school all day. Um, and really pay attention to symptoms. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we all seem to have different tolerances or, or, or something. I, I do think there's a genetic um, hardiness that some of us may have more than others. And some right. of us are just plain lucky. Uh -huh. <laughs> we don't get hit all that hard right, right. or often. Um, but when a symptom shows up, don't just resort to meds right away. You know, I'm not against all meds. You showed me an point. image earlier. Can, oh, could you oh, show yes. that again? Uh, yeah, left, right, side up. Is that about the right place? Yeah, yeah. Bring it okay. up forward just a little bit. Good, good, good. Okay. This is a picture of the month's supply of prescription medications that a veteran in the Midwest was consuming. That's for one month, 30, one 30 days. Month. One month. Wow. Carol verified this with the newspaper out there. Ugh. Now, you're on all these meds. You can't think. <laughs> you cannot think. Amazing. Now, and what, and not every VA doc is like this. But it's, it has to be hard to not use what you've been taught to use. Yeah. And one of my vets got so angry at all the meds they kept giving her, she threw them at the doctor. <laughs> and she got off of everything. Uh -huh. Off of everything. Yeah. And I just had a call from a vet that was in the military medical school study that we're just wrapping up. Same thing. Once he got home... To a doctor would listen to him. He's off of all the meds. Mm -hmm. They can do a wonderful job, especially for pain. But we all know what can happen with addiction. Right. And you know, if your brain isn't free to work the way it should, you're not going to make good decisions. Right. And the other thing I'm thinking of, you 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 showed that image, which is pretty powerful. That's one month, and we're talking about a lot of times young people. So yeah. if you've got somebody that's say twenty something, and that military, that's old. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just I'm just trying not to go to the very you know edge of the 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 uh, age. Uh, but let's just say you got somebody that's twenty two or twenty three, right. and they're doing they're, they're on medications even if it's helping with the symptom but they have that this, to look forward yeah. to for 
this brings up a very important point. There was an interesting study done in England of the anticholinergic burden measured by blood uh, measures in people who were in TBI rehab hospitals. What they found is the ones who did the best had the lowest burden, and they know that those burdens, that those uh, medications, tend to prevent change. Mm. So there needs to be a revolution in how we use meds. Now right. that may run into pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you know, oh, them. I think that's why it's so it's been so hard for neurofeedback people to get funding. Right. Because. You know who's our constituency <laughs> right right uh, but it's going to happen yeah well that's really interesting because um you know like i said the, the old, so many medications and if we're not dealing with something where you're taking a medication for a limited amount of time and it's going to fix the, the problem and then you can stop where sometimes there's medications like that but it, it sounds like a lot of this is just okay this is what you have to do now well yeah. and and each one may have its list of at least potential side effects and they do it's i, I tried to look them all up there's so many i, I just yeah amazing <laughs> it's pointless but you know that's what doctors are taught mm -hmm. these days now there are many especially if you can find a physician who is described as a functional medicine doc, and there are more and more of them who take a holistic view of the person. Right. Because there are many things, many kinds of feedback, many kinds of meditation, yoga, a whole bunch of things right. that can be enormously helpful. Right. One of the things that the vets like very much is the equine therapy. Mm -hmm. I just had one come back from a place in South Carolina, I think. And it was wonderful just being with an animal, interacting with the animal, mm -hmm. very calm, and, and give a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. So biofeedback of all kinds has a lot to offer people right. to begin to recognize the onset of a panic attack. For example. Right. Because the symptoms actually start a couple of hours before the person realizes mm -hmm. that it's happening. Mm -hmm. So you can you can avoid it. Right. Well, it's it's hard to believe that we we've we've been talking for about an hour already. <laughs> so I I, um, I I know you you, you probably have uh, clients to work with. Uh, speaking of neurofeedback, uh, so I don't want to hold you much longer. But did, did you have any uh, anything that you wanted to close with uh, before we we stop? Yeah, maybe one point. The word neuroplasticity is hearing more and more in the popular press, basically meaning that our brains, our nervous systems have the capacity to regenerate, to change. So do not despair. You are not necessarily locked into feeling this way all the time. So don't give up. Go find people. Oh, read our book. Then you'll definitely be better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. But it will give you ideas. Right. About what is out there. Right. Yeah. And as I say, there were so many things we couldn't include, like acupuncture and yoga and meditation. Yeah. And I think the, the book is. When Carol writes the second volume, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> too well, I was just going to say that, you know, we, we were talking before we uh, came on when we were doing our testing for the recording that, um, you know, the way that, um, that, that Carol writes uh, is. is She's, she's very, uh, she's able to make complicated things seem relatively simple. Yeah, she draws, um, she draws pictures with words. Right. So it's easy to understand. And, and, you know, as much as I love our book, the book that preceded it, The Migraines, Brains, and Bodies, is incredible. Right. And, you know, headache, of course, is, right. is maybe the most common um, condition that people struggle with. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get her to, to uh, talk to me about that book, oh, too. Do, do. <laughs> if, if, um, yeah, so so I, I would definitely encourage people to, to get the book and check it out and, and uh, you know, learn more about um, concussion and, 
you know, just how to identify that that's the problem that you might have. Some of the symptoms that you might be dealing with, uh, maybe it wasn't initially called a concussion, but it could be related to that and, and that uh, you, you can learn a lot more about it and, and your options that you have to get help for yourself. Right, and that's where prevention starts, right. is knowing. Right. Find out your coach's, um, what his knowledge, his or her knowledge is of concussion. Right. What do they think they should do? Right. Now, one thing we found out is that, you know, the coach's jobs depend upon, very often, about winning games. Yes. And there have been reported to me a player who said that she was on the sideline, two girls on the field whacked their heads together so you could hear it oh. clearly. And the coach turned to her and said, I didn't hear that, did you? Wow. Now, do you want your kid on the field with somebody who thinks that? Mm. They put themselves first? Wow. No. Yeah. So know the risks, know your coach, know what your pediatrician thinks about concussion. Mm -hmm. Because that's probably the first person you're going to go to. Right. And I think we have to start shopping for our, our uh, providers. Maybe we could have a good housekeeping kind of label. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me. Could you could you just hold the book up so we could see it uh, oh. there before we? You mean the brochure? Yes, the, the brochure. So there, there it is. I don't know where it is. Yeah, that you can pull it back a little bit. Yeah, so that's the book, um, uh, best books in uh, 2014. So that that's a that's a good uh, label there. But again, you know, I think it's uh, it's it's something that that uh, will will be able to help a lot of people. So once it I had a group of um, Iraq Afghanistan veterans come into my office, and the guy picked this up and he started reading. His eyes got wider and wider, and he said. But I have all of them. Right. <laughs> I guess he has a concussion then, huh? <laughs> I, as a medic, I think, yes. Right. <laughs> all right, well, thanks again, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for, for talking to me. Thanks, Harry. It's been fun. All right, great. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.